pretty much two hours, two and a half hours each. Um, but yes, there's that communication, but there's another communication going on between the audience and me and me and the audience on, on, a, on an energetic level. And it, it is an energy event in the end. The energy is, is fantastic because I, I see and feel the energy change as you go through the day. I mean, it's, it's often like in New York, crikey, it was wild from the start. Yes. <laughs> but um, you feel it getting deeper. And, and when, you, when you start to connect dots, and I, you know, I'm connecting more dots all the time because you've got to. I mean, it's a, it's a deep rabbit hole. Don't stop, keep going. Um, and and you, you, you hear the silence of ding, ding, as, as the connections are made. Oh my God, so that's how they do it. Oh my God, so that's how it works. And, and that whole kind of combination of things makes it, um, well for me, it's always a memorable day to do. Because mm -hmm. it's, um, it's an energy event which, which expresses itself in words and pictures, but it, it's a vibrational event really. Um, and, and, it, and it can be very, very powerful because you know, the, the energy of the audience is involved as well. You mentioned that you do it in four sections of uh, your talks. Yeah, yeah. What would these sections be? Talking about reality, uh, yeah, what well, reality is and as such. Yeah, the first section is always about the nature of reality. Uh, because I started on this journey, uh, Victoria, um, 20 years ago this year, consciously, when I had the most extraordinary um, what you might call paranormal awakening. And um, I, I have been moving through the years and some force has been handing me pieces in the puzzle. In, 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 almost in the order to understand it uh, most um, easily and assimilate it. And it started off um, where all the pieces in the puzzle and all the synchronicities all the walking into experiences, walking into people, walking into books, walking into documents, was about how the world is controlled in what I call the five sense reality, this one, holographic reality, I would call it, um, by a tiny few families. They control the banking system, the uh, political system, so that you can vote for someone that says Republican, or you can vote for someone who says Democrat, but you're still voting for the same force that's behind both parties. Same in Britain, same in Europe. Um, they're behind the pharmaceutical cartel, that, who, which have no interest in human health. They have interest in pharmaceutical wealth and control. Um, they don't want well people, because well people don't buy drugs, do they? They want sick people, and so they keep inventing new illnesses and all this stuff. Attention deficit disorder in kids. We must give them, we must give them Ritalin because they've got attention deficit disorder. And then you say, well, hold on a second. First of all, I had attention deficit disorder when I was a kid because school bored me rigid, okay? But let's take your version of attention deficit disorder. The, the symptoms you tell us are the disorder are exactly the same symptoms that uh, of behavioral changes for children have these appalling poisonous chemical additives in food and drink. So what they do, they give kids all this rubbish. It has an effect on their attention uh, possibilities, an effect on their um, hyperactivity. And then they say, hey, they've got attention deficit in order. Give them Ritalin, give them this. This is all it works, so how it works. So this whole first period after I had this massive awakening um, 20 years ago, and it's not an awakening, oh, there I am. It's an awakening, and then it progresses your mind opens more and more to consciousness. Well, let's speak more of this awakening. But, well, if I could just finish this, and, okay, and then, that's... very quickly, then after that um, period, what came into my life was, uh, in this synchronistic way, was that there was a non-human uh, race or races behind this control system. And, and then it went into what I feel is absolutely the most important part, which is the nature of reality itself. Because there are so many people out there now, they weren't when I started off, but there are now, thank you, and more the merrier, who are, who are putting out information about the five cents conspiracy, the uh, engineered terrorist event that was 9-11, the um, uh, manufactured overseas wars and the reasons for them and, and, and all this stuff, and the war on terror, which is a war on human freedom, actually. But until you get into the nature of reality itself, 
and the illusory nature of it in terms of physicality and how we decode information into this reality like a, a, a wireless internet, um, then you c can start to see how these few can control what is, we're told now, seven billion people. Mm, because exactly. their secret society network at the highest level um, passes on from generation to generation of these initiates the nature of reality how humans generate reality, how we interact with reality, how reality can affect us. And they have systematically kept that from the people because if they know that and the population they're targeting do not know that, well, the few are in a massive position of power. And this is why, because this goes, goes back in, in what we call time, another bloody illusion, but in, in the language of this world, this goes back a long, long time. And this is why when the uh, colonial powers from Europe, not least the British, you know, um, when they went into North America, South America through the Spanish and the Portuguese, when they went into um, uh, Africa, when they went into um, Australia with the Aborigines, they targeted the native peoples and they targeted specifically the people like the shaman who were carrying the knowledge, uh, the knowledge of, of reality that, as they understood it, that's been passed through the generations. Crucially, the knowledge of the historical um, sequence of humanity through to this point. And what they were able to do using um, uh, Christianity, uh, of, often overwhelmingly as the vehicle, was to impose upon those native peoples a new religion which demonized the old uh, ways, therefore the old knowledge. And um, as a great friend of mine in South Africa, a, a Zulu shaman called Credo Mutwa, who um, is coming up to his uh, 90th year now, as he said to me, when, when, when the British and the Europeans came into uh, Africa, they milked the minds of the shaman and then killed them, the many of them anyway. And what they've done the is and target anything and anyone that could give a truer version of history and human life and reality so that they could replace that with a, a, a made-up story. So it, it, it's so ironic, to me anyway, that when I, like a few weeks ago, I was in South Africa with Credo Mutwa, when I go in there, I see a country which has the most extraordinary history, the most incredible understandings and knowledge there to be uh, accessed, uh, and it's dominated by Christianity. Um, and and this, the same, of course, happened in, in, in South America and elsewhere. And I'm, you know, I'm not knocking Christianity. I mean, you know, people must believe what they, they want, but these colonial powers specifically used it to replace the old ways. When you say old ways, was there any truth to the old ways opposed to the new ways? Well, you know, you know, I just you, you might have uh, noticed a few a few minutes ago. I didn't say the true. I said the truer history. The truer, okay. Because um, we're all trying to understand many things, and as um, uh, Socrates in ancient Greece was supposed to have said, "Wisdom is knowing how little we know," and we forget that. Um, we think that because we believe in this religion or that religion or that religion, that somehow uh, we've got it. Well, you know, we are sitting here decoding, therefore experiencing and um, perceiving a tiny, tiny frequency range of reality. Beyond that is infinity, all possibility, all potential, and therefore to think that one religion with its rules and regulations and musts and mustn'ts is going to give you all you need to know. I mean, please, over here, intelligent life calling planet Earth. Um, it, you know, it, in, in the filter, in the, um, the lens of the human body, which simply gives us the ability when I say us, I mean consciousness, disembodied consciousness, to hold that book. Because 
consciousness, the true eternal self, is vibrating far too quickly to interact with this frequency range we call the world. So it takes on an outer vehicle which is resonating within the frequency it wants to interact with and therefore I could pick that book up. Um, and what's happened, I would suggest, is that so many people in the world have been coldly, calculatedly manipulated to into a false self-identity that this is who we are. No, this is what we're experiencing. I'm not David Icke. I am infinite consciousness having an experience called David Icke. Uh, that's not who I am. And what we, what we do, and, and we're manipulated to do, is to identify with little me by identifying with the reflection in the mirror instead of looking through the eyes into the true self. And when you move your point of attention so powerfully into something, um, you can disconnect an awareness of anything peripheral or anything beyond it. And people from cradle to grave, because of the way the system works, are constantly encouraged and pressured to focus on five sense reality alone. Uh, and, and if we do that, then we can lose contact, lose connection, lose the relationship between that which is experiencing uh, and that which is um, the real self, the infinite self. And these people, this network of manipulators who've hoarded ancient knowledge and advanced knowledge of reality have created a structure specifically to disconnect um, humanity from an awareness of its true, infinite, genius, all possibility self. Right. They don't want people to wake up. Exactly. To be aware. They don't. They do not. Because if, the, if there are a few, and I tell you, if you're talking about people in full awareness of what they're doing, the number of people who are manipulating seven billion is extraordinarily small. So much so that they have to recruit from the target population people to impose their will upon the target population. This is law enforcement, these are the dark suit administrators of government and business and corporations. And because of the way they've structured society as like Russian dolls, one doll inside a bigger doll inside a bigger doll, in this case, one, a smaller pyramid inside a bigger pyramid, pyramid inside a bigger pyramid, it means that um, the vast majority of people who are every day going to work, not to manipulate the world, but to try to earn a living for their family and, and give them a good life and all that stuff, they're doing that without knowing what they're contributing to, that they're actually contributing every day to their own enslavement and to their children and grandchildren's enslavement. And this is achieved by compartmentalization. Um, in the simplest uh, way, it's what intelligence agencies call the need to know technique. People go to work in these pyramids and they make their contribution but they don't know how that contribution connects with that one and 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 that one to create a very different picture. Only they know that. And this is how the few manipulate the many to enslave themselves. But we are on the cusp, it's very clear, of an extraordinary awakening as people are going, oh my God, I see it now. It's not like I thought it was. No, it's not. So what are we going to do about it? Hmm. What would you say to the people who are those people who are not awake and just go through the changes every day of just going to work and they're feeling completely lost and afraid as as all the countries are shifting and changing and the money's being sourced out and, and the work is being sourced out from their country such as here in America. Well, see... We're in an incredible amount of shift and yeah. nobody is really telling anybody really what's going on. Well, I, I, I can explain what's going on immediately um, from the examples you've just given. I mean, I, I, not only can I explain what's going on now, I, I was explaining what was coming 15, 16 years ago in, in my books, and that's one of the, 
the big reasons that, that so many people are now coming to look at my work, like, you know, it was, there was, couldn't get a ticket in, um, in, in New York. Uh, and it, it, I went to um, the Czech Republic. I was yeah. in the country for three, three days, never been there before. Did a talk that was translated with the audience through having earphones, translations. Absolutely couldn't believe how many people, people came. There is a global awakening going on. And what is happening um, to America to understand it, some dots need to be connected. And this is very important. This is what I do. I connect dots. Uh, because you can, you can look at a dot, like a banking system, look at another dot, um, the crash of September 2008, you can look at another dot, 9-11, another dot, Barack Obama, and each dot is kind of interesting. But people are bewildered because they think, well, yeah, but what does it mean? When you realize what the agenda is, it's like an open book. And, and the agenda is this, it's a multi-level agenda, but let's keep it to what we're talking about here. When you're a few and you want to control the many, you have to centralize decision making. The more diversity of decision making there is, the less control any few at the center can have. When there's a few of you, and in terms of full knowledge and awareness of what they're doing, it is a few, and you want to control the many, in this case, seven billion, then you have to centralize decision making. Uh, the more diversity of decision making there is, the less control any few at the center are going to have. So now, a few bureaucrats, not even elected people in Europe, bureaucrats, are dictating to the whole of Europe, uh, every country. And uh, the power of the countries to decide their own destiny is virtually, uh, you know, it's, it's petering out. It's virtually non-existent now. You know, 75% of laws in Britain start out in Brussels, not London. Really? Right. And, and this is where they want America to go. Now, the, the, what they're heading towards, well, what they want, is the ultimate global centralization, because then they've got the, what they would see as the ultimate global centralization of power. They want a world government which would dictate to every country. They want a world central bank that would dictate to all, uh, all global finance in every country. They want a world currency, which in the end wouldn't be um, cash, and that's going out of circulation so fast. They want a electronic single world currency, right. for which there are fundamental implications for freedom, because if you go into a store now, Victoria, with electronic money, and that computer says uh, no to your card, you say, well, I'll pay, I'll pay cash then. What about when there's no cash and that says no? You have no way of purchasing except barter, and that's the idea, control. Because those that challenge the system will very quickly go off the Christmas card list of the computer, you know? So, and they food and medicine will be also controlled. Yeah, uh, medicine, uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, if they could control um, uh, what we call modern medicine and, and keep it out of my life, which I do, then I would be very, very happy. Absolutely. But we'll, we could yes. get into that as we go along. <laughs> but the other thing they want is a world army. And the creation of NATO is a stepping stone to that. They want a world army. They're looking for a European army now, which this is all part of the stepping stone process. And, and I talked to a journalist once, and um, he said, well, what, why would they want a world army? There'd be no one to fight. You know? And I thought, yeah, you're, you're a journalist, aren't you? Um, so because what the world army is for is to impose the will of the world government on countries that don't want to accept it. And the other point in this list, they want a microchipped population. Now, this comes back now to America. If you um, want a world government dictatorship, you cannot have any superpowers with the military and financial might to say no to you. Imagine if there was a world government through this period of America, through the 20th century, and the world government said to America, you're going to do this, we've decided it. America could say, no, we're not. So what they're doing systematically is destroying America militarily, you know, all these kind of what they call theaters of war. It's a lovely name, theaters of war, because it's all a bloody movie, really. <laughs> um, and right. they um, are destroying America financially on purpose. This is what it's all about. So they'll be dependent related. To, yeah, on, to bring yeah. America to its knees yeah. so it can be absorbed into this world 
um, dictatorship. I've been saying for years and years in my books, they are using America to destroy America. Now, what is happening is they are preparing for global specializations because you know when you've got a country and you say okay there's coal mines there and the manufacturing there and agriculture there but that's how the country's laid out well I've seen documents the early documents for the European Union and they were setting out in Europe before anything which countries were going to specialize in what and when you see it then you see what's happened since and our industries in this country have been run down and things in that country have been lifted up it's just playing out the blueprint for instance it designated uh, Britain not as a manufacturing economy which we always had been you know making things nor even an agricultural economy which we would all been doing lots of farmland growing uh, uh, food for uh, the people self-sufficiency and stuff nor staggeringly it's an island Britain was not going to specialize in fishing either that was going to be other countries of Europe what has happened since um, oh just to finish the point what Britain was going to specialize in in this European uh, economy which we weren't even kind of involved in at the time was finance and what they call service industries serving other you know industries without actually being those industries that is precisely what has happened in Britain the agriculture has been run down the coal mines have been uh, closed or the mines have been closed I think you know, I, I not too bad about that because I think people going under the ground doing that is just horrible but they've closed that and um, they've run down the fishing industry on an island nation uh, to almost destruction, exactly as these papers said decades and decades and decades ago. Now, what they're doing in America now is something similar. So this is where outsourcing comes from. What they decided in the European Union was all these other countries where labor costs were lower they were going to do all the manufacturing. Now you take that to a world level, because it's the same blueprint they want to take that I've just described in the European Union to the world. They're moving the manufacturing to parts of the world that are much cheaper in terms of, of wages and, and sweatshops and all that stuff. And that's what the outsourcing is about. And it's outsourcing into Mexico, it's outsourcing into, into Asia, and this is where all the jobs are going. And the thing about outsourcing or making things in a, another country cheaper and then bringing them into another country to sell them, before there was a big problem with that, and that was tariff barriers. Because you made your, your products maybe cheaper, but to bring them in, to the country you want to sell them in, you had to pay tariffs, which kind of, kind of took out a lot of the benefit of manufacturing. And then came what? Free trade. Free trade. What is free trade? It's freedom to exploit. So what these families did, like the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers, who were two of those families, so are the British royal family, um, they introduced something called the World Trade Organization, the WTO, um, which can impose massive fines on countries that defend their own economies, right? From the merciless world system of free trade. Everyone knows free trade's good. No, it's freedom to exploit trade. It's good for you, darling, you guy over there in the banker's suit, but it's not good for these people who are, who are living in starvation wages. Mm. Um, and as a result of that, if you try to defend yourself from these imports made uh, ch more cheaply on the backs of exploitation of people, then you can get now fined by the World Trade Organization. So what's happened is um, the, the, the downside of exploitation in one country and selling in another has been taken away. And then we come to this word um, that has become part of the language now, globalization. 
What is globalization? I say to the people who go on globalization uh, uh, protests and all the rest of it, and good luck to them, but what is it? It's the centralization of global power in every area of our lives. It's centralizing decision-making. And what does that do? Centralizing decision-making and control over the media, politics, economics, all of it. It gives power at the center to a tiny few so they can control everybody else. And I see globalization protests, and, and, and like I say, good luck to them. But I hear people talking about the fact that it's, it's greedy corporations that are behind it. No, no. Greedy corporations are the vehicle for globalization. They're not the origin of it. Because of the pyramidal structure I'm talking about, this corporation is a pyramid in itself. Obviously, there's lots of people working for it here, and you go, it gets thinner and thinner. Eventually, you've got the people running that corporation. Right, bang. You've got the same here with another corporation, and the same here with another corporation. And all these pyramid points in these corporations are going to the same capstone. So we see uh, Bank of America. We see um, J.P. Morgan. We see, if we have to, Goldman Sachs. But what we're looking at are different names on the same force, different masks on the same face. You know, you can go down to a mall and you can see companies that apparently, and, and you know, um, stores that are apparently in competition with each other. Oh, I'm not going there. I had a, I had a bad time there. I'm going to buy from them now. Well, actually, just, just look at the background. They're owned by the same people. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's like very symbolic when you walk through a mall and you see different names at the top of the shops, over the shop fronts. But actually, so many of them, enormous numbers of them, are owned by the same people. And that's what is happening uh, globally. This has happened over uh, periods of decades. This didn't just happen suddenly. They were talking about this in the 80s, in the 90s, Big Brother controlling and all of this. And people in the know at that time, this was being known. Many, 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 many people. There's more people that don't know what you're talking about than do know. What would you say to the people who are just waking up to this and kind of saying, okay, we're in a bad place right now, and it makes perfect sense of what David is talking about here. What do I do? What can I do? Because if well, this continues on the way that it's going, which it looks like it's going to be happening, then the world is in for what kind of state is the world ultimately going to be in? Well, fully enough, I'm extraordinarily optimistic, me. Because uh, I say this control system's coming down. Absolutely. Uh, but it, 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 it's coming down um, when people remove the backside from the sofa, remove the focus from the game show and the sports, and start looking at what we really need to focus on, which is how basic freedoms are being taken away. And if we think it's being happening now, and it's terrible now what's going on, mm -hmm. then just have a look at what your children and grandchildren are going to experience if this thing goes on. Like I said earlier, um, the target population is vast. The people doing it is tiny in full knowledge of what they're doing. And there's that wonderful um, scene in that animated movie, A Bug's Life, where the basic story, for those who haven't seen it, though it's very well known, is that these grasshoppers, just a few, um, intimidated these massive number of ants on what they called Ant Island to spend the year gathering food for the grasshoppers to come once a year and take it. And on one occasion, one ant stood up to the grasshoppers and said, this is, this is not right, this is not fair, and it's not just. And the next uh, scene um, is that the grasshoppers are in their, what they call their winter quarters. They're in a tree. And they've got all the food they need for the winter. And one or two of them say to the, the leader, we don't have to go to back, at, back to Ant Island this year and, and get more food, because we've got all the food we need. And he makes this speech telling the grasshoppers, the facts of life, if the few are going to control the many. And um, he talked about this one ant that stood up to him, and one of the two of the grasshoppers, yeah, boss, but it's just one ant. 
oh, just one ant, eh? And he explains um, what happens when just one ant becomes lots and lots of ants. And there's this great line where he said, those little ants outnumber us 100 to 1. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. So we've reached a point now where um, people in very, very large and gathering numbers have realized there's a problem. They've realized the world isn't like they thought it was. And uh, I, I know I've been to 51 countries researching and speaking about this. And I've seen it. It's a global phenomenon. It's not happening in one area. It's happening everywhere. But we have to take this to the next stage now. Because if you look at the internet and, and, and all, this, all these different forms of communication, you can see that there is a, a, a very large, increasingly vast body of people who've realized that a few are controlling the many, and that there is an agenda to make it even more draconian as we go along, more Orwellian, beyond Orwellian, actually. But uh, they're still, if you like, standing on the other side of the road, watching it all unfold across the street, and they're like going, what's going to be their next move? Oh, look, they're doing that. I told you they'd do that next, didn't I? I told you. And it's like, it's like people are standing there sort of watching their own prison being yeah. built. Um, they're more aware of it. They now know it's a prison, but they're still watching. And what we need now is to cross the street. Instead of saying, um, this is, um, this is what's, 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 what's happening and uh, what's their next move, we should be saying, what's, what's our next move? Never mind what their next move, what's our next move? Because a, a tiny few, possibly 4% of the population, are probably massively overestimating with 4%. But you say it's 4% of the population of 7 billion are controlling 7 billion. That's insane. They can do it two ways. One, because they do it secretly. And up to this point, they've done that. You know, people do not rebel against not being free when they think they are. And people t tend to sweep through life and they pick up images rather than substance and detail. Mm. And so we think we live in a democracy and, and, and then we equate democracy with freedom. What democracies are in their present state are elected dictatorships. Or in terms of George Bush in 2004, not elected dictatorships, but it's another story. And so what happens? You have an election campaign, someone wins. Um, and then they have told the public what they're going to do. But there's no contract. They've just told public what they're going to do. Why did they tell them that? They told them what they thought they needed to tell them to get the votes to win. What they want to hear. Yes. yes. Then along comes Barack Obama, Mr. Change. Sorry, I hadn't noticed. You're going to, you're going to close Guantanamo Bay within a year, wouldn't you? I think he was. <laughs> and he was, going to, he was going to be changed. Well, you know, uh, it, change has obviously got a new definition now. It's, it's new definition is business as usual, because that's what we've had. Uh, Obama's Wall Street's man. That's why he's, he's doing all these things to benefit Wall Street, while Wall Street are screwing the population. But he then told a pack of lies in his election campaign. Why? To get elected. And then what happens is they tell you lies, they get elected, then, then they do as they like. And then now what we're seeing now, oh, it's the midterm elections. Um, I'm going to go for the Republicans this time because I don't like what these... Hold on a second. Deep breath. Eh. This is how it works in America. This is how it works in Britain. This is the way it works all over the world. During the Bush administration... Uh, Boy Bush was demonstrably, provably, in the mainstream media, controlled by a group of people called neocons, neoconservatives, right? And they, they, these were the Richard Pearls and the William Crystals and the John Boltons and all these people, and the Wolfowitz and all these people. Um, and then Obama took over. And he is controlled by what I call the Democons. This is your... George Soros's, your um, Sabignu Brzezinski's, and all these people, your Rahm Emanuel's. Don't buy a new car off that guy, never mind a used one. And so you've got Puppet A, Republican, 
Puppet B, Democrat. Democ uh, Democons, neocons, same force, right? So you can vote for the Democrats. You can vote for the Republicans. It doesn't matter because whatever you do, you're voting for them. And they're the ones you don't see. And that's why the differences in politics today worldwide are not in reality. They're not in substance. They're not in change uh, for the benefit of the population. They're in rhetoric. Because uh, the Republicans and the Democrats in America, as an example, are masks on the same face. The only way they can persuade people they have a choice at an election is to do it by rhetoric, by words, to try to say we're different because. But as we've seen at a point in American history where on the surface a massive change was going to take place when Obama came in. Change, change. But you notice he never said what that change was. He was never specific. Why? Because if he had been, he'd have been in trouble. So it was a massive mind game on the American psyche where he's saying, I stand for change, I stand for hope, change you can believe in. And what he made himself was, um, and not him, because, you know, they say he's, 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 he's an intelligent man. They're, they're, they're comparing him with Bush, right? Not a good comparison <laughs> of intelligence, really. And, you know, as I say, slow horses look fast when they're running past trees. So, you know, forget about comparisons with Bush. He's not a terribly intelligent man. And this is now starting to come out of the White House from people who worked in there. But he um, created himself, or was created for him, a, like a blank screen called change. I stand for change. Never say what it is. And what it, that al allowed was for the public individual people to project upon him their version of what that change was. And that was a massive mind uh, game which got people to say, oh, vote for, vote for Obama, right? So he gets in. What happens? Nothing, nothing changes except that the agenda for centralization of power and the destruction of America and its people goes on ever more quickly. And, I mean... How much more blatant can you get? How much more in your face can it be that a banking system, through unfettered greed because of a process through Greenspan, uh, the head of the Fed, a private banking system, and Bernanke, Sim um, systematically remove checks and balances on the banking system right the way through from Reagan Bush through Clinton into Boy Bush. And as a result of those checks and balances being taken away, by the way, exactly the same was happening in Britain at the same time, the unfettered greed of the banking system was unleashed in all its horrors. As a result of that, um, they made immense amounts of loans which they knew the people couldn't pay. It didn't matter because as soon as the person had, had signed their name on the mortgage document, they got their bonus. So that greed, that systematic destruction of the checks and balances created a massive financial crash in America. Now, what then happens? The victims of the crash, who've, who've not been part of it, are then through Mr. Change Obama forced to take on collectively vast, staggering, cuckoo land amounts of debt to do what? To give to the banking system that had created its situation in the first place. And then it gets even, it gets even sillier. Because people um, have lost their jobs during this bank-created, greed-created recession, they can't pay their mortgage. So what happens? The banks come along and say, we're taking your house. Get out with your kids in the street. And we're taking this? And people are leaving their homes? What are we doing? When you say to me, um, a, a very good question, okay, what can we do? Well, there's hundreds of thousands of people in this country every month losing their homes. I'm now reading that the banks in their... Honestly, if this, these, 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 this set of bankers, 
if there is a, such a, a thing as, 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 as reincarnation, the, 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 the jail sentence they, sh they, they, should, they should be get, getting would need many reincarnations to finish, mm -hmm. given, to complete, given what they've done and they're doing. They're now forging documents foreclosure documents to get people out. Even some people who paid cash for their homes are getting foreclosure documents from these criminals. And what they're, what they're saying coming out of the banking system is they're forging the documents because there's so many foreclosures, they can't cope with how long it's taking to go through the foreclosure process, so they're trying to reduce it dramatically by forging documents. Well. If they're in that kind of administrative nightmare, when people are leaving their homes when the documentation is complete, what administrative nightmare would the banking system be in if people who had lost their um, jobs because of the recession caused by the banks then said to the banks, you're the cause of this, so I ain't leaving. And we had hundreds of thousands of people every month in this country saying, we are not leaving. They could not cope. They can only do it by uh, picking off people individually, picking off groups and playing th those groups against other groups. Uh, and they're, they're, they're terrified of us putting down these ludicrous fault lines of religious differences and income differences and cultural differences and, and, and perceived um, racial differences. We're all one. These are just vehicles, for goodness sake, no matter what color they are. Um, we uh, uh, have the opportunity, if we put down these fault, uh, uh, put down these fault lines and, it, and, and realize that this is not a conspiracy to enslave Jewish people or middle-class Americans or Muslims or, or Hindus or Hispanics, this is a conspiracy to enslave all of us. Mm -hmm. And while we're divided and ruled, we'll never figure out, figure out, to quote the grasshopper, we outnumber them, not 100 to 1 in our case, but by noughts and noughts and noughts to 1. And we need to figure that out because then goes the way of life of these criminals who have no empathy, no heart, no soul, and they're doing this en masse to people without any empathy for the consequences for the victims of their uh, criminality. No. And we need to come together here and, and stop cooperating with our own enslavement. Never mind, you know, protesting in, you know, at, at, at Parliament or, or, or Congress or whatever. No, no, they can cope with that. Indeed, they can, they can say, oh, we, we need to have more control and surveillance and, and, and enforcement because of all these protests. No, no. They're not frightened of that. What they're frightened of is us not acquiescing and um, uh, allowing ourselves to contribute to our own enslavement. And there's no better time to start than to en masse, and those who are not being foreclosed to support those who are, en masse, we ain't leaving. And then we'll see how much power these people have got. Because the power, this structure, and all these strutting uh, criminals think they have is only one thing. It's the ability to make us, the people in general, perceive that they have power. They have no power. The only power they have is the power we give to them every day through acquiescence. Enough, enough, enough. So it's very loud and clear, and you're very passionate about it, that something that I've thought about very deeply for a long time, that people really need to own their own power, their own energy, their own life. Exactly. And we've been giving away our life, so many people, the greater amounts of people have been giving it away to, to the collective, to others, to, to whatever is the moment of flavor of, of politics or, or, or country or patrioticness or what have you. Let me, let me, let me, let me give you an example. Um, yeah. it, it, we're, we so perceive wrongly where power lies that when we look at a pyramid, we look up, don't we? We always look up. I think humans have had something taken out of the vertebrae here, yeah. you know, so we look up. The power's at the top of the pyramid. Oh, really? Why is the top of the pyramid up there? Because the rest of it's holding it up there. And we stand there in mainstream society doing this, holding the, holding the house of cards together, and they sit at the top. 
And we, they, 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 are, they are feeding off our efforts, they're feeding off our energy, they're feeding off our, our um, um, employment, they're feeding off our fear and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, they're feeding off our ill health, because of course the pharmaceutical cartel doesn't want healthy people, no profits in that. And we're standing there. And we are the ones with the power. And do you know something? They know that. Yeah. They are terrified of, of, of us going, hold on a second. <laughs> I'm holding you up there. Yes. I have enough of that. Boom. That's what they're terrified of. And that's the, the, the one level, one level uh, that the awakening is bringing out. Yes. A reassessment of the dynamics of power in this world. And it's not with the elite, the elite, the cesspits level of control and imposition. It is with the people they are targeting. There is a massive global decade after decade, century after century mind game gone on to persuade the mass of the people that the few have the power. No way. I won't have it. Won't have it. And when we don't have it, their way of life is over. And it's coming, it's coming. But we have to get the backside disconnected from the sofa and let's get on with it. We have the power. What you're doing when you're voting in a rigged system you is you're giving credence you're to a rigged to system. Exactly. You know, you say, okay, you give me a choice and I might think of choosing. But you give me no choice. I, how can I choose between mask one and mask two? Just because they're called a different name. I, I, I watch these debates, and I, you know, and I watch them. And what about your background? And whoa, did you did you smoke pot at Harvard? Oh my God! That's the only thing they can think of to argue about. Mm -hmm. Because in all the essentials, all the essentials, they agree. They agree. See, this is a, a point, an important point to make. Take fascism and communism. We're led to believe communism is over here; it's of the left, and fascism is over here; it's of the right. But they're just the same thing with a different name. It is centralization of power in the hands of the few, dictating through military and uh, law enforcement imposition upon the many. I wonder if people in Nazi Germany were going, I'd much rather live under Stalin, or people in, 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 in Russia were saying, I'd much rather live under Hitler. No, of course they weren't, because they were just different, again, masks on the same face. And if they can sell to us that two things that are so the same are actually so far apart, right. well, what, what, what problem have they got with Republicans and Democrats or Labour and Conservative in England? Let's go a little bit back to the beginning. When did you start to realize this? What was your awakening many oh, years ago? Uh, it's a long story, but I, um, I was, I was a, a journalist with the BBC, a mm -hmm. frontline, what you would call anchor in America. And I was a national spokesman for the British Green Party, which was brilliant for me with hindsight because it showed me that politics is an irrelevance when it comes to changing anything. <coughs> oh, go, got a cough now. I've been talking for ages this yes. week. Yes, <laughs> very passionate. <coughs> Love it. Getting passionate there, my voice is going. Um, and uh, I, had a, I, I had an extraordinary paranormal yeah. experience. Oh. Uh, I, um, well, many actually. And, um, and what happened? For a year, when I was a television presenter and working for the Green Party, um, when I was in a room alone, I felt like I wasn't. And I'm, I was new to all this. Um, I wasn't into religion and the idea that we're all a cosmic accident that science tries to sell us. I mean, please, you get letters after your name for that, you know. I don't know why, Al, but you do. Um, so that didn't, make, room, that, that, that didn't make sense to me either. But I, got, I was getting on with my life. And, uh -huh. But this, this presence became more and more tangible as the year unfolded, 1989. And I had this experience where uh, my son went into a new news agent shop. Little boy, he's, he's a singer-songwriter now, 27, but he, 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 went, he went in, in this news shop. And, and, and after a while, I went in after him because I was talking to someone outside. And I said to him, come on, uh, Jay, we're going to get some lunch in the town. And as I turned to go, this is um, March 1990, my feet wouldn't move. It's like, you know, they were pulled to the ground, were like magnets. And of course, this is all new to me. I think, what, what the, what, you know, what, what, what the? And, and then this, not voice, but very strong thought form went through my head. Go and look at the books on the far side. What? 
So I walk forward and just look at these books, and they're all romantic novels. But in there is this woman's face, and it was different. So I, I picked it up, and I, I turned it over. And um, it was a um, book by a psychic lady called um, Betty Shine. It was called Mind to Mind. And I thought, I wonder if this lady would be able to pick up what I'm feeling, this presence. So I went along to see her, because I was well known, I got in quick, because I was on BBC uh, most days of the week at some, sometimes. And um, I didn't say anything about this presence. I just said, um, I've got arthritis, which I have, rheumatoid arthritis, um, and maybe your hands-on healing, which she did, would help. But my real reason, that, that was the kind of, maybe it will, but um, my real reason was, will she pick it up? And, and I went a couple of times, and we had a chat about other dimensions, all made total sense to me. Anyway. On the third occasion, I'm lying on this like medical type bench, and she's doing this n near my knee, just off from my knee. And I felt like a spider's web on my face. And this took me aback, because I read in her book, she said, well, w when other dimensions or other consciousness is trying to lock into you, sometimes you feel like a spider's web on your face, right? So I, I, that hit me immediately. Go, oh, go, cool, cool. this was in her book. I never said a word to her. And about 15 seconds later, 10, 15 seconds later, after I got this spider's web, she went, oh my God, she said, I'm going to have to close my eyes for this one. This is powerful. And my, my bum is slipping down the bench, and I'm going, what's going on? And then she said, I'm seeing this figure in my mind, and it, uh, the figure is asking me to, to pass information to you, basically. And the first line was, they, they know you wanted them to contact you, but the time wasn't right. And this referred, I never mentioned it to her, this referred just a few weeks earlier, where I'd sat in a hotel room in London when I was working for the BBC, just on my own, and the presence was so tangible, I actually said out loud, look, if there's someone there, something there, would you please contact me, because you're driving me up the wall. And this was the contact. And I'm lying there. <laughs> You're going to go out on a world stage and be world famous for revealing great secrets. Uh, one man cannot change the world, but one man can communicate the message that can change the world. You will buy, you will uh, rather um, write five books in three years and all that stuff. And a stream of things which I'm thinking, you're having a laugh. They're all happening or have happened. And this is the force I talked about earlier. Where, where this synchronicity of information and experience has handed me these puzzle pieces to put together the picture. And there's a long way to go yet, but in 20 years, my goodness, have we come a long way in understanding the world uh, as it really is, as opposed to the one we're told to believe it is. Absolutely. This is your uh, latest book, Human Race, Get Off Your Knees. The cover is absolutely amazing, the artist. Well, I, uh, I got that picture and I've got a, a friend, I've got a picture in my mind and I, I've got a friend, uh, Neil Haig, who's a great artist in mm -hmm. England, he, he illustrates my books and we have this kind of telepathic connection because I, I explained to him what I want. I said I want, I want a male lion uh, on the front, I want the world painted on its face and I want the eyes, the eyes specifically, very powerfully, I have to say, don't mess with me. Okay, that's, that's humanity coming out of fr from the lamb and the sheep into the lion, the true self, the true infinite self, the true potential, the true I'm not being a slave, I'm infinite consciousness, I'm being a slave, are you having a laugh? Yeah. This is the awakening. And so that, that, that was um, a very powerful image. And the title, Human Race Get Off Your Knees, The Lion Sleeps No More has really resonated with people. Because one of the things that the title does, Human Race Get Off Your Knees, it lets people also on one level say, do you know, I am on my knees, aren't I? I am a slave to the system. I get up in the morning, I go, I get the same traffic jam, I go to work, I can't leave to a certain hour because it's a prison. We send children to school, they can't leave, uh, uh, leave between those hours, it's a prison. Um, and, and I am on my knees, and that's the first step to awakening right. and getting off your knees. And there's another thing that's interesting I, I noticed when I was writing that book. I have a thing in it where I'm saying, get your head out of the sand, right? But when you think about it, there's a picture in there. Mm -hmm. There's a picture in there where, where, where I, I show it right at the start. And it's like, 
you, you cannot put your head in the sand without being on your knees. Ah. Right? Yes. The two go together, not just physically, 